Okay, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for uh, the invitation to give you a lecture about perimplantitis <coughs> in general and about how to avoid perimplantitis and how to um, uh, rescue cases which have been affected by perimplantitis, cases which have been done by two, by two stage implants. Uh, this lecture is given on behalf of the International Implant Foundation Munich, Germany and uh, on behalf of the prosthodontic departure of Jaipur Dental College, Maharaj Vinyak Global University, Jaipur in Rajasthan, India. Let's look at the contents. Uh, there's a first part of this lecture uh, is dealing with the problems of periplantitis, how it, how it uh, happens, um, what are the signs, how long does it take and so on. Uh, factors leading to periplantitis also will be uh, addressed. In the second part of the lecture uh, we will talk about corticobosal implants, about the technology of the strategic implant. Uh, implants which do not have periplantitis as a side effect. So this is the point in my lecture to, to explain uh, to the audience that uh, if you simply use the right implants you will not have this problem. Actually your patients do not have this problem. Uh, from my experience uh, being an uh, implantologist now more than 25 years, uh, I see that the problem of perimplantitis is um, neglected. I mean, everybody knows it exists. Almost all the patients have it. Uh, but nobody is really willing, in the, I mean, nobody in the two-state world is really willing to do something about it. So that's, of course, a, a problem that's, I think, also unacceptable. Now, what is perimplantitis? It's, um, a collapse of bone structures near the implant in the area of the crest of first cortical resulting in the development of crater shaped, shaped or uh, horizontal bone resorption. So there's a loss of bony attachment around the implant and uh, first it's crater-like and then if there are a number of implants of course you will see horizontal bone loss and <coughs> uh, in the end uh, almost all the bone is lost. Uh, what is uh, amazing uh, and not understood by many cl clinicians is that um, the more per perimplantitis happens the more bone is lost, typically the more stable the implant is. So the precondition for the development of perimplantitis is the stable osseo integration of the crestal implant. So we are talking about crestal implants, implants which are anchored in the first cortical, in the oral cortical, uh, and it will then take after implant placement approximately two to three years um, until perimplantitis is uh, observed, uh, and typically this diagnosed as after it is diagnosed after two to three years uh, in the mouth, and it's done with X-ray. So the significant features of perimplantitis are that uh, the load transmission from the implant to the bone is relocated to more basal bone areas uh, into the direction of the apex of the implant. So the bone loss is uh, near the first uh, cortical, or actually the first cortical is being lost, it's, it's kind of relocated apically. Uh, Trestal bone areas reduce their mineralization significantly due to disuse atrophy as well as the result of a checkerboarding feature of bone and as a result of remodeling and subsequent bone optimization. So uh, one part of the problem is that there was too much bone there from the beginning and uh, during the process of remodeling uh, bone optimization takes place so less bone will be there at the end of the process of remodeling. Um, I will show you some cases later where you will be amazed uh, how little bone is necessary really to stabilize implant and this uh, I hope will make you think. So these developments take place in the vicinity of those implants which uh, promote such development. Perimplantitis is however not found around all designs of dental implants. The radiological signs are crater-like bone destruction, uh, vertical bone resorption, Clinical sign, of course, uh, is an opportunistic uh, colonization of rough implant surfaces, so the bacteria appear later. Um, they <coughs> inhabitate uh, the rough surfaces of the two-stage implant, and uh, then we see rubor, pus, dolor, color, and all the signs uh, of an infection. This uh, is used also by diagnose, uh, for the diagnose. Um, 
Here in this picture you see a number of uh, unwanted developments in the bone. You see an apical osteitis uh, on, on the tooth. Then in the implant, the implant on the left side, you see crater-like bone loss. So this is a typical sign for preimplantitis. Then you see a metal particle inside the bone, and this gives the cause to an osteitis. And as soon as the implant is inserted then into the <coughs> bone, this osteitis becomes bigger, and it's all around the implant. But as you see, uh, there is no attack on the first cortical, so uh, this is an osteitis, this is not a periimplantitis. <clears throat> now let's look at the timeline. Uh, within the first six months, for, I mean at the timeline for two-stage implants, at the first six months we see early implant failures. They are not, of course, due to periimplantitis. So there can be pre-existing infections in the bone, infections carried into the bone during implant placement, then too high torque, uh, too low torque. Um, sometimes we have a discussion that there are allergies against the implant material. Um, however, I would say that allergies against titanium and its alloys uh, in in the, in the jaw bones are pretty rare, I think they are not even existing. Then we see something that the colleagues like to address as idiopathic failure, so failure out of nothing. Not enough distance between the implants to the teeth and so on. Uh, then uh, the colleagues are discussing the abuse of alcohol, smoking, general diseases, overheating of the bone, perfunctions, the age, bad bone and so on, low vitamin D level. All this um, uh, contributes uh, according to literature and according to the opinion of some uh, colleagues to early implant failures, but of course all these failures are not due to perimplantitis. As mentioned before, it takes approximately two to three years until out of the periimplant mucositis, the periimplantitis develops and periimplantitis uh, affects then directly the bone. Now, what can contribute to periimplantitis? There's also a little bit confusion uh, in the literature. We can read about titanium iron leaks, I mean, titanium leaking from the implant into the bone, the genetic of the patient, immune system activation. This might lead to a kind of rejection. Uh, although there are no immune cells in the bone, I'm always amazed to read this. The lack of implant controls, so I'm not sure how somebody can control something like this, but I mean, I'm only listing up from the literature. Then too many osteoclasts, so somebody obviously has counted them and put them into relationship with the uh, osteoblasts. Uh, then abrasion of titanium due to friction and mobility between implant components. You know, this is a reason which was taken over from the traumatology field where of course um, hip um, endoprosthesis or knee endoprosthesis, there, there are parts which move against each other and there of course we have abrasion of uh, particles, uh, but uh, we don't have this. Around dental implants, so I would say this uh, this um, picture drawn up by Mr. Albertson in 2016 is um, uh, quite a piece of rubbish. It doesn't really help to understand the problem. Um, this is the problem in general. We have wrong and misleading explanations um, given in the what I call blended literature. I mean, these are the, the peer-reviewed uh, journals which uh, kind of uh, only right off from each other and where um, it is very difficult to publish uh, the truth. So this is an example here um, by Mr. Albertson of a um, you know, compilation of, of ideas which uh, I don't think are true. You, you're welcome to read this. Uh, it's 2016. So this picture is more <coughs> useful for us. So you see on the very left healthy perimplant tissue, then you see perimplant mucositis, I mean this can happen at any time, then you see perimplantitis, as I mentioned this happens after two three years and it requires also integration uh, and then later it comes to the implant loss, but between the, the, the second picture from the right and the very right picture can be many years. So what are the real factors leading to perimplantitis? This is uh, according to literature, and this is also actually my view. Well, first of all, uh, the large implant diameter contributes to perimplantitis, then the rough uh, and dossier surfaces of the implants contribute to perimplantitis. The multi-piece design of the implant, um, uh, this is a leakage, but it's not a, a leakage from abrasion, but this is a leakage uh, out of the gaps between implants and abutments, for example. And of course, uh, there's a big field uh, of bone reasons connected to 
to especially to the large implant diameter and the large uh, implant length of the two stage designs uh, and the large endosseous surface um, we have to accept that the lack of function for the bone close to the endosseous uh, surface of the implant is one of the main reasons why bone uh, disappears or why bone is remodeled away actually as I said before it's optimized so when does periplantitis stop? Well, either it stops by itself or it never stops. We have no way to influence this and there are some palliative treatment approaches, for example the polishing of rough implant surfaces. You see this here. This imp these two-stage implants have been polished. I mean, the colleague called it polished a number of times. But you see how poor the results of intro polish polishing uh, are. So if you polish it like this or you don't polish it at all, it uh, doesn't uh, make a difference. The interesting is that, that the colleagues understand after they place the implants and after the perimplantitis occurs and the bone is lost, then they suddenly understand, oh, it's the rough surface that makes the problem. Uh, and um, I think it's very illogical what they are doing. I mean, they put the rough implants and later say, oh yeah, it's rough, you know, that's the problem. And um, the question must be raised, why <laughs> didn't they put from the beginning polished implants? I mean, this is a German ducks hunt, very clever dog. Even a dog understands that simply the wrong implant was chosen from the beginning and this made the problem. Now I will show you in the second part of the, the lecture that there are alternatives today but we don't have to put these rough implants at all nowadays. Now, how frequent is perimplantitis? Available data indicates that one out of five patients will develop a perimplantitis sooner or later, uh, <coughs> while four out of five patients will develop a perimplant mucositis. So, um, as I said before, perimplant mucositis is only the way to the perimplantitis, so these four out of five uh, will have in the end perimplantitis. The only question is how much perimplantitis will they have on every single implant? Uh, there are <coughs> a lot of articles published in this direction but the scientific data is not consistent probably because the research and the publishing is uh, blended um, <clears throat> there are uh, articles about the definition etiology prevention and so on um, you can look at this in PubMed and I found a very uh, interesting article written by Mrs. Victoria Wilson an insight into perimplantitis a systematic literature review uh, Miss, Mrs. Wilson came to the conclusion that patients with two-stage implants are more susceptible to developing perimplantitis than are patients with natural teeth to developing periodontal disease. Now, she put this in very nice words, but it means that, uh, that of course, perimplantitis is very frequent. It's more frequent than uh, periodontal disease. Uh, and as we know, everybody has a periodontal disease, so then we can say that almost everybody who has a dental implant, two-stage implant, these crystal implants, of course, that they will develop um, Perry implantitis. This is a shocking uh, result. Unfortunately, uh, obviously, the <clears throat> profession doesn't want to read things like this. Uh, then there are articles available um, by the group of Simeon from Italy. They have uh, dealt, uh, dealt a lot with the um, machined implant. You remember that uh, Professor Simeon uh, is a very, very early implantologist. Uh, he has a lot of experience and when all these rough surfaced implants came up, he Mm, well, he really liked to use them because because advertising told that uh, that so far he was a successful implantologist, but now with the rough surface, you know, it will be the top of the top, and there will be uh, no more losses at all and no problems at all. And he saw in this phase in the 90s, he saw exactly the opposite happening. And he, um, you find his lectures on on the internet, uh, and you can listen to that too. So they were simply shocked after a short time, after two, three, four years, about uh, what implantitis can do also. <coughs> I want to remind you that this word perimplantitis um, was developed uh, after the rough uh, implant surfaces were developed. It was not seen before. So there are some factors which uh, promote the development of perimplantitis around conventional implants. I would say this uh, list is true. Implants can be placed uh, too close to each other. Implants are equipped with a block of crowns because this blocks the function. Implants placed in non-chewing zo zones of the jaw bones because anyway there we see uh, the, these are tension zones and there we see osteoporotic uh, developments. Part of the implants are placed in non-resorption stable bone Then iatrogen factors, no hygiene, no possibility for hygiene. Um, here's a um, 
picture out of a textbook. Of course, these implants are too big and uh, the, they are too, I mean, too big and too close to each other, so there's no possibility for the bone uh, to survive. I would say, <coughs> if implants are placed so close, then even um, polished implants would show this development. Here you see um, <coughs> a harmful blocking of the crowns. This of course creates too much rigidity and uh, if uh, you have blocks of crowns uh, on implants then on crystal implants actually and two-stage implants if you have blocks of crowns you are blocking the the, the bone's uh, elasticity and this will lead to disuse atrophy and to a loss of bony attachment. On this case you see <coughs> on one side in the lower jaw more bone is lost than on the other side <coughs> and this usually, usually is um, due to uh, developing of a chewing side, so obviously this patient was chewing on his or her left side because there's high mineralization and of course the bone uh, stays better. <clears throat> Here you see profound peripatitis on the non-chewing side, uh, this is the right side of the patient and much less peripatitis on the chewing side. So this is something that you should uh, remember if you still are putting these two stage implants that this is very very important. Um, the, I find this picture interesting. Uh, it shows us how much integrated implant surface is required to stabilize the two-stage implant. Uh, almost nothing is required, so the question has to be asked, um, why are these implants then so big? I mean, these are, are big bullets. <laughs> like for Kalashnikov, and uh, it is not necessary to have this big uh, surface. Um, this is an, unfortunately uh, very difficult to explain to two-stage implantologists because they are, you know, this is like a religion. They are they are brought up in the belief that implant surfaces have to be large and even enlarged, and this actually is then the roughness which makes uh, the problem. Uh, look at this picture, it's taken from, from uh, Swiss SSO journal some year ago. And there you see how well an implant can be integrated uh, in the basal bone, because the basal bone is a resorption stable bone. So remember this word please, basal bone or corticobasal implants. These implants don't show any perimplantitis and they are anchored very well. Another, another picture in the same series of slides. As you see, this implant is perfectly stable. The rest of the bone has been gone. There's big infection around the implant and the implant uh, is stable. Of course, the patient is suffering in this situation from uh, infections and um, the question is when will this implant be taken out? But basically the implant is stable, the, the tooth is stable and um, these implants are counted in the, in the two-stage world. They are still counted as uh, successful. <clears throat> um, I don't want to comment this, but this is the situation in the two-stage two -stage world. Uh, look at these pictures, I mean, dramatic. So why doesn't the, I mean, this patient, for example, in the upper right uh, jaw, has a lot of uh, infections, deep pocket, more than one centimeter pocket, pus coming out every day. So why is the patient not um, uh, doing anything about it? Because the only thing is the, the implant needs to be taken out and then there will be nothing. So the patients worldwide are suffering under those two stage implants to say it clear these are the wrong implants the wrong implants were chosen from the beginning and then these these problems occurred and um, to add this right away adding adding uh, bone augmentation material to the show uh, doesn't improve the situation it even makes the situation worse Another example, the patient which came uh, to my clinic, you see the, the, the resorption takes place to the point where the basal bone starts. You know, this is, uh, you see the white line uh, uh, on the panoramic picture, you see this on the left side of the implants. So this is uh, actually the demarcation line, line and until the, the bone will resorb easily. It means, in general, that the use of alveolar bone for implant anchorage is not a good idea um, because this bone, as we all know, is, is not resorption stable. The first uh, cortical is from the, from the position uh, of the cortical, uh, from, from the position point of view also not stable. It uh, resorbs, there can be horizontal resorption, vertical resorption. So to use this first cortical uh, as it is done in two-stage implantology is, in my view, a very bad idea. Uh, look at this picture also here. Here, uh, very little bone is really needed to stabilize this the bridge. So the question is, why did uh, did these colleagues start from the beginning to use these implants? Why didn't they anchor the implant in the resorption stable cortical bone areas? 
I want to add here that uh, also cement rests, uh, which will be colonized by bacteria, uh, can have influence. Of course, these implants uh, got lost because of peri-implantitis, although they are a single piece and, and polished in the upper part. And the reason is that cementless rests were um, <coughs> um, you know, forgotten or not taken out, or for whatever reason they were left there. Uh, bone loss seems to be connected also to specific treatment providers, very interesting article. So some treatment provider uh, generate more, I mean prosthetic treatment provider uh, generate more bone loss and, uh, than others. So some you see the, the red line on top, so this is a very good treatment provider. The, uh, the blue line on the bottom, dentist number five, seems to have more problems. So of course um, these two-stage implants are very, very susceptible to precision. Mm, if they are, if there's no precision, if there are gaps, some interest and so on, we see more peripatitis and I think this is the, the, the reason why we see these um, differences. Uh, let me remind you that whenever you put an implant uh, into the bone, this will lead to atrophy. Uh, I know that we are being told the exact opposite. We are being told that the, the, impl I mean, the implants are bone keepers. No? They, they are kind of, the, because of the, this, this miracle surface, the bone attaches there and then uh, everything is good and they are keeping the bone, they are preventing the atrophy. This is of course not true. Uh, this picture shows uh, hip endoprosthesis after 16 years. Actually, um, I mean, on the left side of the picture now, you, the, hip, the, the metal uh, prosthesis was taken out, you see only the cement, but you see how dramatically uh, the <clears throat> amount of bone went uh, down compared to the non-operated side, compared to the right side. And um, uh, we see the same, of course, uh, with dental implants. Uh, uh, if these implants are too stiff, like two-stage implants, they will definitely cause this problem also. And this is one of the reasons why we see perimplantitis. So for the two-stage implants, I want to conclude that these implants are basically unsuitable. So conventional two-stage implants, um, although all the world is using them, they have so many disadvantages that I personally cannot recommend to use them. Uh, the design of these devices is too stiff. Um, the endosis surface is typically by far too large, I mean larger than required. The surface roughness brings only disadvantages. Um, the diameter of the implant body is too large. And last but not least, the multi-piece design shows a number of disadvantages. There is, in my view, no point to use uh, uh, multi-piece uh, implants. Um, remember Mr. Einstein said um, one interesting and very true sentence, he said only idiots hope for a different outcome while they do the same wrong thing again and again. Uh, in my view this is um, so true for the field of two-stage implantology. Um, unfortunately we live in a world where those who are suffering under these implants uh, have no nothing to say, they have no word, they cannot uh, complain about this. And uh, so that's why these implants are still being put by practitioners who um, don't think about what they are doing. They are, they are thinking maybe, do I do, I do this thing right? You know, but they stopped asking the question, uh, am I doing the right thing? You know, and this is what uh, practitioners should think about. So let's look at uh, the strategic implant, cortic basal implants. As you see, the, the, the diameter of the implants is very thin. The implants are fully polished. Uh, these are single piece implants and they are anchored in the second cortical. So basically these are traumatology devices and that's why they can be used. Uh, in immediate loading protocol, just like all trauma devices which are anchored in the cortical are used in an immediate loading protocol. Now, I mentioned before that there are unfavorable uh, developments uh, in the beginning, so this is true also for uh, the strategic implant, but uh, for the strategic implants we, we know very well from literature that there is no perimplantitis and after about two years no more implant derived Im complications are to be expected and this is in my view very important to tell the patient. So what are the unfavorable developments? This is first of all overload osteolysis and this is a retrograde osteolysis. The overload osteolysis is, uh, it happens if repeatedly two high forces act onto the second or third cortical. I mean this is not the, the oral cortical but the, the next cortical, I mean the, the distal cortical. Uh, micro cracks can accumulate there. Due to the repair of the bone remodeling, the mineralization goes down in the vicinity of the implant and implants and prosthetic uh, construction sooner or later appear mobile. 
The bony site which is affected by the osteolysis is initially sterile. This is important to understand. So although the implant is mobile, uh, the, there are no bacteria involved because the surface of the implant is polished all the way down from uh, to the apex or from the apex to the abutment. The whole thing is polished. So uh, this is not very sus um, susceptible to, uh, for infection. <coughs> Due to low, lower mineralization, the ability of the corticals to hold or resist loads is reduced and uh, the partly demineralized bone areas become prone to infection. So if this overload osteolysis is not treated, for example, by reducing the forces, for example, with botulinum toxin uh, and uh, by adding more implants to finding the reason for the overload is usually a prosthetic uh, reason, then this overload osteolysis can be deleterious for, for those implants and the constructions and the implants are lost. Uh, retrograde osteolysis, on the other hand, is what you see here on this on this picture. So if uh, during the um, implant surgery little particles like concrements or little particles of cement are inoculated into the fresh extraction socket and are screwed down into the bone, then you see this development. This is a retrograde osteolysis and the implants affected by this have to be taken out. So these are the two two things that can happen to the strategic implant. Besides this, there is no um, perimplantitis happening and we have to be uh, very careful with using the word perimplantitis in connection with the strategic implant or with the corticobasal implants in general. Um, it is actually a fact and it's proven in literature that there is no such thing as a perimplantitis around these implants but I'm showing you that there can be other developments for other reasons uh, and and this can look like a perimplantitis but they are not uh, this is not a perimplantitis and keep in mind uh, the two stages cannot do anything against perimplantitis it starts when it wants to start start and it ends probably never it, ends when it wants to end. But of course we have it under control if this uh, retrograde osteolysis happens or if overload osteolysis happens. So here are some uh, uh, rescue cases. You see the lower jaw is, is uh, full of infections. Uh, upper jaw already equipped uh, with a strategic implant. Uh, then the lower jaw is cleaned up, so all the teeth and implants are being taken out. All the infections are removed. Step two this is the middle picture. And then three months later you see the bone, the lower jaw has started to heal. Um, the holes in the bone start to heal and to mineralize. You see this very well how this is rescued. Uh, uh, here's another case. Patient came with a bar uh, construction um, and perimplantitis in the upper and in the lower jaw. This is the lower jaw, then I have uh, removed the bar. These are the implants, infection everywhere, poos everywhere, it's a real disaster. Then all implants were taken out in the lower jaw and in the upper jaw. Uh, the upper jaw received right away the final treatment with the strategic implant. Lower jaw received a temporary bridge uh, because in the lower jaw I didn't want to put implants into the sites where perimplantitis had been before. So I made a little tripod in the lower left side of the patient, added one implant in the front, one in the area of the premolar, and I used the, the, <coughs> the leftover molar on the right side in the lower, which is actually very untypical uh, to do this. Uh, in strategic implantology, usually we extract everything, then we, we, we have no problem with the teeth. But it was done here and we left the patient with this long-term temporary and told him that uh, the lower jaw has to be equipped sooner or later with more implants and this uh, molar will be taken out. So far, this is now about approximately seven years ago, patient uh, didn't come for this uh, replacement, but uh, he reports and sends picture regularly. Here you see a case of perimplantitis in the upper left jaw. Already all implants, including part of the maxilla, were lost. You see the same starts to happen now on the, the right side. The front teeth are um, not cannot be rescued. You see severe perimplantitis also in the lower jaw. So what did we do? We re removed everything in the upper jaw, including part of the anterior uh, frontal bone segment. In order to get a nice aesthetic, we removed also the implant in area 4-6. Uh, replaced this implant by the bridge. Just to stop this perimplantitis uh, and this is the final uh, construction uh, three days later. So this was done of course in the immediate loading protocol and uh, we can now expect that uh, the bony defect uh, on the lower right jaw will recover over the years when the patient uh, is doing good function on the implants uh, and um, <coughs> this case was rescued. Um, 
Now, a short uh, overview of the differences between two-stage and strategic implant. Uh, Mm, conventional two-stage implants use the method of so-called osseointegration, integration, whereas the strategic implant uh, is used is using the method of osseo fixation. So this is a trauma method. Um, early unwanted developments in the first six months. Um, well, as I said before, in two-stage implantology, there are a number of reasons, speculations about reasons, and so on. Uh, often the real reason why an implant gets lost uh, uh, is not uh, known. This is a one point that I don't like about two stage implantology. I mean, these colleagues, they they drive against the, the wall with the car and it's a total damage and they don't know why and they, they're going to sit in the next car and drive again. So this is something I personally don't want to do. Um, looking at the strategic implant technology, we have overload osteolysis, retrograde osteolysis, and that's it. And this is both in our hands so we can avoid this. Uh, late unwanted uh, design-derived developments after two to as many years as you may think about. So in conventional dental implantology we have perimplantitis. I mean this is the game to, after two to three years to keep perimplantitis under control. The game for the implantologist who makes lots of money with this and it's also a game for the patient because he has to decide when to end the show, when to take these implants out. And as I said before in the strategic implant technology we don't have this type of development. I'm showing you a case here, 15 years post-operative radiograph, it's two compression screws with a polished neck, uh, one disc implant in the middle. Uh, you see that there's little bone loss on the right implant, but this is simply because the crown, crown was over, overhanging with too big crown. But this is what you can expect uh, to see in, in, uh, in long-term results. I mean, I see this now uh, for 25 years, these, these results, uh, that there's no perimplantitis. In general, there is no perimplantitis around these single implants, uh, single piece implants with polished neck or especially round implants which are completely polished. Uh, this is a case which uh, we treated more than 20 years ago. Uh, it's a 20 year post operative maxillary radiograph. Crater like bone loss is only present around rough implants. So, this implants 1, 5, 2, 3, 2, 5, and all the polished implants are not affected. This case is uh, so interesting in my view because uh, we have treated this case uh, with the implants which we had available on stock, and some of them were already changed to the, to the non to, to the non rough, to the polished polished, fully polished disc implants and other implants were still on stock and they were rough. So we have uh, kind of created a, a study case without knowing it because we, we didn't really know what makes perimplantitis but you see very well you see here's the this is the bone loss here here's bone loss even to the to the basal disc and there you see fully polished implants and you see uh, no bone loss at all fully polished implant no bone loss at all here you see right next to it a rough surface implant the bone loss goes up to the second disc so this is in my view very impressive case which I mean this is a we got this result just by uh, chance and we were able luckily to, to observe this patient for 20 years it's almost uh, 25 years in the meantime and uh, the re result is the same so these rough implants because the, the disc implants have of course the, the anchorage uh, through the disc plate in the cortical so they don't become mobile uh, but the infection can can creep up along these rough uh, surfaces or creep down in the lower jaw you see the designs which were which were 1998, all rough, even ripped on the shaft, and the designs after 2001, which we, we were uh, producing and using uh, after 2001, fully polished implants. And there's a big, big uh, difference between those designs. So I mentioned that, please uh, remember that uh, Massimo Simeon, professor from uh, Italy, has published a lot uh, of studies uh, about machined implants, uh, also a 13 to 32 years retrospective study of bone stability for machine implants, survival rate 97.7%, there is no perimplantitis. And if I read such studies, I ask myself, why are the colleagues not waking up and stop using rough surfaces? I mean, this is so simple. You, you just have to change a little bit to your technology and learn technology of the strategic implant and you get rid of the problem. I mean, your patient get rid of the problem. Uh, another article by Simeon, you find all Simeon articles on, on, uh, on the PubMed, so... Uh, there's a lot of literature available also, a lot of, um, I mean, proven literature. 
So avoiding perimplantitis is possible by simply refusing to use two-stage implants, I mean implants with rough surfaces. Uh, there are three studies, the Dobrinin uh, et al., Balka and Lazarov and Lazarov, 2019. This was all published 2019, so uh, if you are interested and if you want to know, these studies are available there, you can read it all. So the conclusion is that uh, ossifixated um, corticobasal implants do not develop perimplantitis. I mean, this we know from literature. Uh, corticobasal implants allow treatments in an immediate functional loading protocol and they avoid bone augmentation in general. They are the devices of first choice in oral implantology today. Two-stage implants should be avoided whenever it's possible due to the big risks, the long-term damages caused by them, and furthermore, because of their frequent necessity for bone augmentation. I mean, this is another point, but I just want to mention it here. And, uh, of course, I also don't like to use two-stage implants simply because they, 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 they have this healing time, which nobody wants. Two-stage implants have Today, only very few indications, in my view. It's for young dentists not worthwhile to learn about this outdated technology at all. I mean, we have enough colleagues who, who can do two-stage, no need for new, young, um, bright and brains to, to learn this. Uh, Perimpatitis is 100% avoidable, avoidable if the right implants are chosen. Um, the International Implant Foundation offers, in cooperation with MVGU University in Jaipur, this Diploma in Immediate Loading in Dental Implantology. There we talk only about uh, work with polished implants, cortical implantology, using uh, the corticals for immediately loading, uh, for fixing immediately loading constructions. Um, uh, you see my email there eden1962 at gmail.com if you are interested, if, if you want to register, just write to me and I will forward this to uh, the relevant persons. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for your attention and I hope that everything is clear and I hope that uh, this lecture makes you uh, change uh, what you are doing to your patients. Thank you very much.